That's right, once again, we're at the world famous Meltdown Comics on Sunset Boulevard talking about comic book movies, comic books, where the world's mesh. Schnapp, what do we got talking about today? Well, Jeremy, today we're gonna talk about one of the most underrated and weirdest, goofiest characters around. That's right, the Vulture. Like a weird old man floating around with wings. <laughs> well, hey, Spider-Man Homecoming, Michael Keaton, he was Batman, now he's Birdman, now he's the Vulture. We can't get him away from these wing things. Let's talk about the Vulture. Dude loves to fly. I know. All right, Schnapp, here we are talking about one of the most interesting, invigorating Spider-Man villains of all time. Not gonna lie, Schnapp, you're gonna have to sell me on this one. Let's do it. All right, you know what? It's a really hard sell, but what I gotta go back is back to the basics, back to the original to get everybody into who the Vulture is. He's a cranky old man. He puts on some wings to like rip off some diamonds. Let's get into the original, very early, thickest omnibus that I'm gonna make you weight lift that song. Right. He also showed up in Spider-Man issue number two, him and the Tinkerer, it was a two pack, two for one, villains. They weren't really the most popular Spider-Man villains. You haven't really seen that much done with the Vulture. That's why you really haven't seen him in the Spider-Man movies. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a weird pick to go with the Vulture for right. Spider-Man Homecoming, but the minute I heard Michael Keaton yes. was cast, I was like, Birdman is now the Vulture. I yeah. mean, it makes perfect sense, and he's an incredible actor. Let me pick something that a lot of people really probably don't know about. It's a little tale by John Byrne, and it's called Chapter One, and it's a retelling of all of the original Spider-Man, Stan Lee, Steve Ditko comics, and they kind of brings them up to speed, I'd say, but in also in a very loving and original way, like it's another kind of back to basics for Spider-Man where you can see the vulture done just like the uh, bitter old man that he always yeah, there is, he is right there. flying around up against a young teenage Spider-Man. So basically, this is really the truest vulture that you're gonna get. And I always defer to Spider-Man 2, Sam Raimi Spider-Man 2, where I was like, Doc Ock, that's not a cool villain at all. And then I saw the movie and I was like, no, Doc Ock is awesome, he's rad, and he brought it on course for me. I really feel like they can do that with the Vulture in this one. I have seen Stranger Things. Yeah. Funny thing is, I love the fact that Spider-Man really kind of saves people in one pose ever. And it's like, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, this one is, arm holding it like a this suitcase. Is, this is homage <laughs> after uh, St uh, Steve Ditko. So mm -hmm. that's oh, the yeah. original. And this is actually the Alex Ross homage to the Steve Ditko. And then there you go. I'm gonna find every cover of every video game, every <laughs> movie, every book that has Spider-Man saving someone in this pose. Definitely. There has to be more than a few. There's it's at least amazing. 17. So if you had to pick one of these, right. To give someone to be like, here's the vulture. I know what you're gonna yeah. pick, man. You, the weightlifting, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, get ready to get a little bit of muscle protein going <laughs> on there, Jeremy. There you go. Look at that thing. Oh my God. Schnepp, this is the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> This is, truly is the hugest book. Yeah, and that's quality to, right there. That's that's everything you'd ever want from a Spider-Man comic book. Steph, you could start a religion on the girth of this book alone. <laughs> All right, my man. So let's learn about the Vulture, and we'll learn a little more about Spider-Man. Oh yeah. And why the Vulture's gonna be rad. Let's do it, my shoulder's getting it. tired. Bum, 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 bum. Ba, 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 ba. I feel like Charlton Heston from Ten Commandments with this thing. Look at the size of this. This has to, hey, oh my gosh. It's a lot of goodness in there. Yeah, you know, well, thank you very much for teaching us about the Vulture, who I guess has the potential to be a great villain. Who knew? But thank yeah. you, Schnapp. Oh, no problem. So thank you very much to Meltdown Comics for letting us film here. Support your local comic. Don't stop now. Uh, Support your local comic book shop if you want to learn more about the Vulture or Spider-Man or pick up a tome that may or may not be seen in the Ten Commandments. Schnapp, let's do it. Let's, yeah. Hello, awesome Tacularites. We're at the world famous Meltdown Comics on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, California. We're here with John Schnepp. We're going to talk about the comic book movies and what comic books those movies pulled their inspiration from. Schnepp, what are we talking about today? Well, this week, Jeremy, we're going to talk about Superman's best friend, Lex Luthor. That's right. Fancies. Jesse Eisenberg is popping Jolly Ranchers, but not in the comic books. Let's talk about Lex Luthor's appearances in the comic books and some of the best ones for you to read. Let's do it.
All right, so we're here at the Lex Luthor and Superman section. Schnepp, where did these fine on-screen Lex Luthers get their motivations from? Well, let's start off with this collection just called Lex Luthor, a celebration of 75 years of Lex Luthor. This okay. kind of goes through all of his major appearances, starting with Action Comics number 23 back in 1940. What? All right, hold on, hold on. Uh, so d if I'm doing the math right, that's about three point something years of no Lex Luthor. So what was Superman doing for that time if there was no Lex Luthor? Well, I think I he mean, was fighting uh, mobsters and giant robots. Robots, they, they just kind of gave him a, his ultimate villain. Just like Batman has the Joker, Lex Luthor became Superman's ultimate villain. Okay, so thank you, Lex Luthor, because yeah. before that, we would have had dumb arcs. Okay, so Lex Luthor is, you know, we know him as like Johnny Businessman, politician. He wasn't always like that, so there was a change from Gene Hackman Lex Luthor to business Lex Luthor as we know him, and I imagine that happened somewhere in here. Totally. The Richard Donner Superman classic with Gene Hackman playing Lex Luthor kind of touched on him being like a nefarious, weird, underground criminal right. businessman, right. a bad businessman, but John Byrne kind of revamped Superman in 1986 with The Man of Steel. Okay. And so this comic basically also revamped revamped Lex Luthor and recast him as an actual businessman, a very successful businessman running everything in Metropolis. He was the number one news source in Metropolis before Superman came around. So Lex Luthor began to hate Superman because no one was talking about Lex Luthor. He's now number two forever because he's Superman's always going to be number one. Let's get right into another incredible, what I think is one of my favorite Superman stories ever. It's All-Star Superman. Now this is That's the collected point. edition. It's called the Absolute Version. It's the flavor pack for all the true sweaties who want to get the ultimate edition. <laughs> this is actual, the comic. It's, that's a big, a, yeah. it's a card, it's a, it's a wooden sleeve. So this comic by Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly kind of sums up everything that Superman is and ever has been, as well as his relationship with Lex Luthor. Basically, Luthor poisons Superman in this comic at the very beginning, and we go through this complete story arc where Superman has to realize his mortality, and Lex Luthor finally realizes who Superman really is and what he stands for. This is one of the best Superman huh. books ever written. I highly recommend this. Anything that takes Superman, like, because his powers are what he can do, but it's not who he is. Yeah. Anything that shows who he is, it's a great Superman story for me. That's fantastic. Okay, so we have our Lex Luthor Spectrum right over here. If you had to tell a fan, buy these, you'll know who Lex Luthor is, what would they be? Well, I would definitely say to pick up All-Star Superman because it's great. It shows Superman's relationship with Lex Luthor as well as the rest of the DC universe. I would definitely get the Lex Luthor celebration of 75 years because this samples everything from his very first appearance in Action Comics all the way through the 50s and 60s. Also has a couple issues from the Man of Steel run from John Byrne where he became a businessman all the way to the later issues. Nice, so, so you get the spectrum. You get to see how Lex Luthor evolved from yeah, the greatest criminal mind to the businessman we know as him today. That's fantastic. So these are the two. These are the two right here. Let's get the two. All right. All right, so we came, we saw, we got informed from Schnepp. Schnepp, thanks for, uh, thanks for telling us about these. Thanks for telling us about Lex Luthor. We now have two books that I have to hold like they're the Ten Commandments or something because they're so huge. So support your local comic book stores. Go out there, get these. Schnepp. We have some reading to do, my friend. We certainly do. Let's get into that Lex Luthor. Let's get sweaty. Let's do it. Here we are, a week out from the San Diego Comic-Con, which has come to represent the one true global nerd gathering place for everyone who loves the celebration of comic books, science fiction, fantasy, all genres that have been explored in role-playing and video games, movies, television, and multimedia. This is it. This is the place that people travel from all over the planet after entering a lotto to get into another lotto to get the prize ticket of entry. Here we are. This is the place we go to see previews and trailers of all the big films and series coming out in the near future. There are so many paths we all explore to meet and hang out in different groups across the internet with RPG and D&D gaming nights, with movie trips and TV binging. Together, we are all bonded by our mutual loves. Comic conventions now share these worlds of so many millions of people by bringing them all together under one roof. This is the culmination of decades of conventions growing from small conference rooms at the Ramada Inn to giant convention halls. I remember my first comic book convention. I was 12, 
and my dad dropped me off in New Haven, Connecticut at a creation convention celebrating Star Trek science fiction and comics. This is where I saw the very first trailer for Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and a short preview documentary for David Lynch's Dune. This was my first taste of a big new world of like-minded fans who loved exactly what I loved and appreciated the little corner of my world that I could not share with the normals. I grew up a nerd who was picked on and bullied and laughed at for liking comics, for the very thing that opened my mind and led me to become a professional writer and director in the worlds of film, television, and comic books. I lived in a world with no internet, no computers, no cell phones, and the only way to interact and meet my fellow brethren was at these conventions. I learned to become fearless in my approach, direct in my contact with others who liked what I liked, and from that grew some of my best friendships. If I didn't find my fellow drippy sweaties that populate the conventions all across the globe now, I might have become a very different person. I stand here before you because of comic book conventions. It's because of my love for animation and comic books and heavy metal that I helped build and design and direct the cult series Metalocalypse. It's because of this that I met Morgan Spurlock, who was talking with my better half Holly Payne at a San Diego Comic Con party. It's because I was in Morgan's doc, Comic-Con Episode 4, A Fan's Hope, that I met John Campia and became a regular on AMC Movie Talk, then Collider Heroes, and now Film HQ. Beyond the massive, culturally expansive global growth of comic book conventions, lots of people seem to have the wrong idea about what they're all about. They might think they're just empty nerd parades filled with product sales booths, but it's so much more than that. It's entertainment from every aspect coming together to celebrate the mind's tributes. It's for everyone who embraces the creativity and the imagination of the entire Comic-Con community. What would I do if I did not have all these beautiful people to share my love and talk with them about the imagination unleashed, the creativity explored in all the many different mediums that are now with us today? To be a nerd at a comic convention now is to be accepted, rejoiced, and celebrated. There is no hatred allowed in our world of the imagination. We are the strong-minded and the accepting of all races, all thoughts, all beliefs. Everything is because it is all possible in the mind of creation. And to live in a world that accepts pure creativity is truly the only way to live. Enjoy Comic-Con. I'm John Schnepp, and this has been Film HQ. Hey, what's up, sweaties? It's a brand new episode of Comic Book Shopping. I'm John Schnepp, we're here at Meltdown Comics. I'm here with Martin Starr, that's right, from Freaks and Geeks, Silicon Valley, and the brand new Spider-Man Homecoming. Can't wait for them to get my character. <laughs> that's right, you're gonna be a pop. No, there's more breasts than butts. Mm-hmm, sounds great. How do you have all this knowledge of all these? Let's geek out, Martin. You call them sweaty because you think people sit at home and sweat while they watch them? Hell yeah, or they're just sweating it when they're reading about comics and they get into it. So excited they sweat. See you later. Hey, this week we're gonna change it up a little bit and talk about this week's brand new comics that just came out, Mark. Now, it sounds weird. Stay with me. Batman and Elmer Fudd. Now, I never thought I'd ever recommend something this stupid in my life, but this is incredible. And it is a take on Elmer Fudd done like a film noir. And you'd think you'd never want to check this out, ever. And then you see some of this artwork, and you see some of the dialogue and the scripting. And now- And then maybe you want to check it out, or maybe you don't. So the, you may still come to the same conclusion. I'd say this one, is really cool. Cave Carson, it's written by Gerard Way. So My Chemical Romance, he's now doing all of these really? comic books. Yeah, his little grouping of comic books is called Young Animal. There's Mother Panic, there's Doom Patrol. Have you ever thought about being a comic book salesman? Yes, I have. I try, you know what, I, I always try to pimp comics because I think comic books are not only a gateway drug to fucking fun and excitement, but it's good for the soul. Yeah, I got no argument there. What comic do you remember? What's the first comic that you ever read? I actually had a subscription to Spider-Man and coming full circle, being a part of the movie is pretty cool. How do you feel about being in the film? I'm really proud to have been a part of it. I think it turned out really great. And I've, I've known some of the guys at Marvel for a while, uh, Jeremy Latcham. I guess I've known one person at Marvel for a while. So it's cool to have finally gotten to work with him and John Daly uh, co-wrote the movie. So 
coming full circle from Freaks and Geeks to this. I loved it. I got a chance to see it. It's amazing. I see what you did there. Speaking of Spider-Man, let's yeah. go to the Spider-Man section and check it out. Okay. Well, let's do that then. Okay, let's talk about some Spider-Man comics. I would highly recommend getting this. This is an incredible comic. It's called Craven's Last Hunt. This was printed in the 80s. It follows a lot of Spider-Man. Your story Spider checks out. Yep, definitely. Printed in the 80s. Total 80s. It says right there. Yep. Spider-Man with the black costume. He's going through a lot of stuff. And that's, then Craven is like, That's called gonna, Venom. So he's not Venom yet. This is before he becomes Venom. This Venom. is Petey. All right, man. I'm not going to argue with Martin Starr. It's Venom. But it's actually Peter Parker. No, no, that was, that was Venom. Flash Thompson. Flash Thompson. Now he's dropping some crazy knowledge, man. He's mixing cinema, movies, comics. I'm digging it, though. So here we go. We've got the Spider-Man, the Scarlet Spider edition, like Spider-Man. This is not Homeless Spider-Man? It could also be called Homeless Spider-Man. Or PJs. Yeah. It looks like he's wearing PJs. So there's going to be a pop of you popping out in this movie, I know. Eventually. I, uh, you know, I, I would not hold my breath. Are you signed up for more Spider-Man sequels? I am not, but I would love to be a part of more if that, if that works out. Well, he's going back to that same high school. I think everybody's going to be back, yeah. so I think you're going to be back. You're Professor Harrington. Uh, yep. Your character was written by J. Michael Straczynski, one I, of your favorite writers. Yeah, he is my favorite. Yeah, we were talking about that before. That It, it is pretty crazy that he, and apparently only he wrote. Yeah, he created Mr. the character, Harrington. and also your character dies by the hands of the chameleon. Oh, man, I die. What is your favorite comic that J. Michael Straczynski wrote? Uh, Supreme Powers, probably. Now, Supreme Powers, if you guys don't know about it, it's actually an adaptation of the Squadron Supreme, which is kind of a loose amalgam of Justice League and the Avengers. Martin, with my, my super-powered X-ray vision, I actually see a copy of Supreme Power over there. Oh, wow. You want to check it out? Yes. Let's go over there. After me. Check it out. Supreme Powers right here. Thank you. Are we supposed to talk about it? Yes. Okay, let's talk. So this is the comic you're talking about that you really dug. There's a whole bunch of these different characters, like Nighthawk is the amalgam version of Batman. Mm -hmm. Best thing about it, boobs. Only above the waist, though, so don't get your hopes up if you were looking for, you know, some below the waist situation. It's a fun read, too, because you have, like, Nighthawk, who's kind of like Batman, but, like, they play into the archetypes that we're already familiar with, mm -hmm. and he does his own take on them. So, Martin, you've had some... I hear you have a question. I totally do, man. So, you've had... Were so, you talking about Party Down? I was about to talk about before that. Okay. You've had some amazing roles, like Freaks and Geeks. Thanks. Party Down, wore this especially for you. I appreciate it. And of course, Silicon Valley you've got going right now. You were in a ton of Adult Swim stuff, even like you Not just... Not to brag. So you've done so many incredible roles. What are you looking forward to that you haven't done yet? Um, skydive alone without someone attached to the back of my... Yeah, not a friend who's like, I've got you. He's like, no friend. No safety harness. He's no friend. He's just a protector. It is uncomfortable. Yeah. There is a bump in the middle of your back. It might be happy for him. Not so happy for me. Hey. Hey, what's up, Martin? Let's go comic shopping. I want to show you some amazing comics that you're going to dig. I would like to do that. Come on over here. You like to buy comics? Kind of. With people? I do. In front of cameras? I do. Perfect. You know what I like? I like Neonomicon. That's Alan Moore and Jason Burroughs. Incredible HP Lovecraft Freak Fest. <laughs> I got Check it. I'll it have out. to pay for that. <laughs> now, this is a story what about What is this, like these, Jason Bourne? Exactly like Jason Bourne but with demons. Is that a dildo? Welcome to the Necronomicon. I want to introduce you to an amazing comic book written by Grant Morrison right behind you. It's called Earth One, Wonder Woman, that's the comic. It's fantastic. Hey, it is the comic. Clearly there's some S&M going on. The guy who created Wonder Woman was a big S&M freak. I think I could be into it, is that real? Yeah. So when you're doing S&M, uh, what's your like safe word? Wonder Woman. It's two words, but... Just check out some of this artwork. There's more breasts and butts. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. This is. Are you sure this isn't a porn shop? This is like what the, they based a lot of the movie based off of this newer version, 
where he's in high school and it's kind of a retelling of all the original Stan Lee Steve Ditko comic books. Mm -hmm. But I think you'll get a kick out of it. It's really well written. Are you ready? You ready to check out? I think so. Hey guys. Yo. He's got the super stack. Super stack, yeah. Mm-hmm. So which one are you gonna crack open first? Um probably one of the dirty ones. Uh, 17842. Cool. Uh, ooh, don't have it. Um, do you mind if I just take these anyway? Yeah, it's, it's fine. Thank you very much. Of course. Anytime. Anytime. All right, I'll be back. Hey, thanks for checking out the show. Definitely see Martin star in the brand new Spider Man Homecoming out now. Martin, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me in your porn shop. Let's go read some comic books, man. Oh. Yeah, read them. Yeah, yeah, that's what we'll do. The Art of the Modern Trailer is a multi-step hype machine process to get us into the theater and spend our hard-earned money on that specific film. A trailer is a tool, a commercial to entice you to see the full film. We step into the movie theater after the 10 second preview trailer for the teaser trailer for the full trailer that we are all built up for, for this life changing film to change our lives and change our underwear and give us a trans-dimensional godlike super orgasm of new and never before super experienced awesomeness. Why are we here in this situation right now? Can't it just still be just a movie? Can we simply have a genre picture that we know we're gonna be walking into the theater and be surprised? Can we not know every single beat, every scene with the beginning and the ending shots already burned into our mind's core by the continual usage of it in the trailers? Trailer culture has always been with us. From the start of cinema, we'd have trailers, which were at the actual end of the film, hence the name. These promotional tools had large text, voiceover, a few key clips from the film, usually a magic close-up of the main star, or some big show-stopping moment from the film. As technology evolved, so did the movie trailer. These evolved over time to where we are now, with the trailer literally mini movie moments, all snuggle cut up together with almost every main action scene from the adventure film, or almost every funny joke from the comedy film used in the trailer, ultimately all to get the audience to decide to go see that film because they have to compete with streaming bingeable series, thousands of movies that are online and on cable and on SVOD, VOD, OD, ODB, BOD, Elemental P. You know, the options are limitless. How do we know if the trailer has tricked us or shown us too much? Managing our expectations when being excited by a trailer is the answer for all of the above. If you're an action fan or a comedy fan or a fantasy fan, those are the films that you're gonna gravitate towards and the trailer's job is to sell you on the setup. I think the key for us nowadays is to brush away the clutter and expectations and our own ideas that have been built up by the onslaught of the trailers to let us experience the film as its own thing. Sometimes lowering preconceived expectations means that the film might speak to you in its own voice instead of your own. And then the true message or story or scene will be allowed to come through and cut through all the static and noise that has been built up around you and it. Let the movie be the movie and not what you think the movie should be or what you want it to be or even what the trailer told you it is. Whether the film is good or bad, it's ultimately your decision, your opinion, your experience. Wash away all expectations and then just experience the film for what it is. In this week's final act, I'd like to talk about the ideas behind branded entertainment in film and how different all kinds of prepackaged and post-marketed franchises address the ideas of creativity and originality. Products come in all shapes and sizes and in all forms of usage with multimedia entertainment like watching a movie, being as different from eating dinner to playing a video game to listening to music to solving a puzzle to washing your clothes to brushing your teeth. Now products are all used in every single one of these scenarios and branded products fight for our mind space in these arenas as well. 
So it shouldn't be surprising to any of us that studios would look to some of these popular brands, brands that we use, think about, or speak out loud nearly every single day, brands that are part of our pop culture vernacular, as Star Wars or Coca-Cola, as topics for themes for movies. Recently, we've seen board games like Battleship, toys like Lego, and mobile games like Angry Birds get film adaptations as Hollywood races to take their branded properties and rebrand them as possible film franchises. For many years, video games have been a go-to source for branded film material. We've had moderate successes like Mortal Kombat, and we've had giant bombs like Mario Brothers, Double Dragon, and Street Fighter. More misses than hits, these video game adaptations have really never been a smash hit, with the upcoming feature adaptations of the immensely popular games Warcraft and Assassin's Creed, time will soon tell if the video game movie curse can finally be broken. What we do have today is the continual announcement of new franchise films based off of board games and other products that don't really seem story oriented let alone properly positioned to be made into feature films. We've got a movie in the works based on the board game Monopoly. We've got features being developed for expressive images called emojis. We've got films based on the Pez candies in a trilogy being developed for Tetris, a game about moving shapes around. I mean, I like Tetris. I play it on my phone every other day. The theme song has burrowed its way into the back of my brain, and yet I never once imagined this game should be adapted into a storyline for a movie. Obviously, somebody has imagined Tetris as a movie, and they thought of a full-on trilogy storyline that will shock us with its original take on a game about moving shapes around. So, what seemingly storyless brand will some studio executive think would make a great movie next? Are we going to see Levi's get an intricate and deep backstory, Crest Gel Toothpaste get its very own three-movie space saga, and Progresso Soup get personal multi-level soap operas? Are we going to get a Doritos origin story? Do we really need to know about the night that the Pringles guy killed Nutella with a Clorox wipe, only to be taken down by Snap, Crackle, and Pop, thrown into a time-traveling Nutter Butter, and then swirl down a Listerine Vortex to land in the time of the Rice Krispies Taco Bell Wonder Bread Wars? <laughs> Actually, I'd see that movie. Now, we've seen some fun films come from board games like Clue. We've seen really entertaining and super creative blasts from what originally seemed very questionable, like the Lego movie. I admit the idea of a movie based on the Monopoly game at first pissed me off. But then when I thought of the story being told by all the different game pieces now turned into characters, it became a rags to riches race for the ultimate control of Park Place. And that could be a fun film to experience. What we need to remember is there is a balance that is needed and necessary when telling any story, whether it involves a plastic bag blowing a lot of city street that represents how the main characters feel adrift and alone in American Beauty, a used toy bin filled with branded older toys that have outlived their owner playtime, and Toy Story, the origin of Facebook and the social network, all of these films are wildly different, involve brands as their main storyline, and all work as incredible films. Can we go too far? Sure. So where do we reach the balance in branded franchises? Is Pez the idea of the movie much worse than the actual Pez film when it finally is made? I think it's the brains behind the adaptations and the creativity that is let loose that makes or breaks any movie, whether it's an original script, a book adaptation, or a story spun on a branded product. The end result, the final product, the bottom line is, is it a good movie? And that's ultimately all that matters. I'm John Schnepp, and thanks for joining us. All right, Jeremy, we are here at the New York Comic-Con 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Look at all these people. That's a lot of sweaties over there, man. <laughs> like, literally, probably 100,000 people are going to be here. We are here on a Saturday. It's like literally the most packed day of the entire four days of New York Comic-Con. These are our folks, Snap. This is yeah. our energy. This is our people right here. So yeah, we're in the block, which is like where a lot of different artists come together. They have their vinyl toys, their art prints, things that they made. This is Nakatomi, this is uh, Tim Doyle's prints that you might recognize. He's an artist from Mondo. He's got a lot of cool Blade Runner, Star Wars. Ninja Turtles. Over here we got a guy whose name is John Snow. Here's my booth over here. Don't be modest, don't blow hey. past this, oh, man. So I got, Basket your booth. I got my Metalocalypse stuff, my Slayer comic, the hardcovers out. I got my Death of Superman Lives What Happened. It's just a lot of this is how I rock uh, the New York Comic Con. 
This is Tara McPherson's work. She's a graphic artist, incredible designer. She, she loves doing these uh, portraits of, uh, of ladies' faces. And now she's moved into Care Bears. <laughs> now she's, she's McPhersonized Care Bears. The heart belly button is vomiting a rainbow. Yeah, love me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's my heart? I want to show you guys some really cool, they're like these kaiju vinyls. This guy I got my eye on, I might get that. Oh, yeah? It's really cool. Snap, I know you're a lover of monsters and horror. So yes. this has got to be one of your favorite booths in this entire Oh part. yeah, no, I, when I saw this, I was like, what? I was like, oh, right. oh, 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 which one should I get? Snap yeah. is like locked uh, into this space right yeah. here. We'll never see him again. This guy's got a cool camo vest and he's a mutant skeleton. So really cool stuff. That is cool. That's brain a brain boxing? glove. That's really dope. No pain, no brain, a boxing brain. I like this a lot. Yeah, I'm drawn towards any kind of sculpture with brains. Yeah, yeah, it. any morbid shit. Schnepp just kind of yeah, hones in on it. You know, just, hey, they got official props, Schnepp. Yeah, let's go on in, man. Hi, world. <laughs> Star Wars The Last Jedi, December 15th. Yeah. Be there. We never heard of it. What is it, a sequel to something? <laughs> Every prop in here was actually used in the film. So now let's check it out. That's kind of a schlumpy looking Poe Dameron. I love the updated gear and tech, you know? I mean, there's something about a good rebellion blaster rifle that just, all you can do is add patina and just <laughs> make it look more war ribbon, that's and that's right. what they've done. I'm sure the same red lasers or blue yeah, lasers Yeah, right, this is the same, it's the same red yeah. and green. Yeah. Yeah. The design of those red guards, the samurai, whoever they are, I just love it. This is Finn's backpack, it says right there, which I love about that because you can hypothesize, at least at that point, that Finn has something to do. We were hypothesizing about these <laughs> yeah. weird arrows, like yeah. they're exploding arrows. Or yeah, yeah, like, it's just like, it. ding! Oh, bam! Uh, right, right. Does know. he have a blow dart? <laughs> I, would like to, yeah. I would like to see that. I would, yeah, he has a blaster on his backpack, and he's like, I got this. Yeah. All right, Jeremy, well, now we're heading down into Artist Alley, where yes. all the comic book writers and artists are doing their signing, selling their original artwork. But before we get there, we're going to walk by the Justice League. They're displaying all the costumes. Let's do it. There are replicas of the costume. I believe most of them were like test pieces okay. or whatever. Like the, this is the version of the costume that they made before they actually put on the actor. So here we are, Jeremy. We're in Artist Alley, where, as you can see, some of the greatest of the greats are all here displaying their artwork. Comic-Con gets lost under the, you know, the, the movies, and then you have the merch, and all of it's great, but this is the lifeblood of Comic-Con. This is yeah. why there is a Comic-Con. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's great to see these. Right, check them out. All right, so this is a bunch right here. Here's Art Adams. So Art is an incredible artist who's been doing comics for over 20, 30 years. Like a million years. Yeah, like he's done everybody. Oh, like he's done the Fantastic Four. Basically he's done... invented paper. He's, he has different uh, sketchbooks, as you'll see a lot of different artists have different sketchbooks that they have available that they'll sign. Look, there's this Islander, the Metal Luna. The, there's a, a bunch of cool monsters in here. You know, that's my thing. So here we are. We're in the like the, the, the cream of the crop area where the true collectors and people who are interested in reading comics go to. to not just right. get a good bargain, but to get that comic book that they've been looking for their entire life. Here we go, man. Amazing fantasy. Yeah, let's, let's check out some of these classics over here. Look at that. First appearance of Spider-Man. And that is really, so good, for a 5.5, that's really nice shape, yeah. you know? There you go, Schnapp. The New Mutants. 150 bucks? That's a good price for an original. You gonna get it? I, no. <laughs> it's a little, it's out of my price league right now. So Jeremy, the reason to go to New York Comic Con is because they have everything. You can buy comics, you can buy vinyl toys. The San Diego Comic Con has a lot of, all right, here's a new trailer, here's some movie footage. You have that stuff at every con, but this one's, there's a lot of merch, a lot of comic books, a lot of collectibles. Good Thank you very much. See yeah, you we're out. Woo. What's up, Sweaties? John Schnepp here. I'm at San Diego Comic Con 2017. Let's go talk to some people that are milling about in line. I want to find out what they're here to see. Let's go. Oh, so what's your name? I'm Pablo. Pablo, what's going on, man? So you, you must watch Collider Heroes, right? Of course. Oh, yo, yo. Oh, I watch Collider. I watch Collider Heroes, watch Collider Jedi Council. Right on, man. Snap zone. What panel are you here for? Uh, Game of Thrones and Marvel Tomorrow. 
Nice, man. That's going to be awesome. They have the Marvel and Game of Thrones, Defenders, so many different panels. Uh, tomorrow's Marvel panel. I'm actually heading to line up right now. They might show that Infinity Wars uh, trailer. We're here at the line for Hall H. I'm going to ask these people, what are they uh, in line for? Hey, what are you guys in line for? No, I know it's Hall H, but what is the panel you're in line for? Game of, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Everybody Game of Thrones? They're all tired. They're sweating. They don't want to talk. They're like, I've been standing here. Hey, what are you, what are you guys in line waiting for? Game of Thrones and Defenders. Game of Thrones and Defenders. And you said uh, Walking Dead? How long have you guys been waiting in line? 15 minutes. They've been four hours. You're 15. Damn. This is the right game right here. They're like, we just showed up. We don't. Oh shit! It's defenders. All right, sounds good to me. That's why they're all filled with hatred right now. And I was like, what are you guys? In? This was the response. What are you guys in line for? It's a full amount of people are about here. They go. It's the Hall H experience. I love watching you guys in your podcast. So big shout out to you. Guys. Right on. Thanks, man. Enjoy. That's right, this is uh, the world of YouTube podcast panels and sweaties. Everybody's here, everybody's got little digital devices, they're covering stuff. We're covering them covering stuff. That's how it rocks. It's like this weird, gigantic, amoebic creature. We're like, <laughs> I wonder, where where would Waldo and Carmen Sandiego be? Uh, they would be at Comic-Con. What's up? Hello folks, once again we are here at Meltdown Comics on Sunset Boulevard talking about comic book movies, comic books, and where those movies got their inspirations. Professor Schnepp, what do you got for us today? Well Jeremy, this week we're going to talk about Marvel crossover films, these big events that Marvel does where all the characters hang out, meet each other, battle villains. So let's cover all the big Marvel crossovers from the 80s right to now. Let's do it. So here we are. We're going to talk about some wars that are secrets and other things. What do we got? That's right. Well, Jeremy, we're going to talk about Marvel's decision to grab a bunch of their characters, chuck them on a planet, throw them around, shake them up, and see what happens. It started with Contest of Champions, and we're going to see a little bit of that in Thor Ragnarok. So the great thing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is they pluck little things from all these different big event films, stuff from the 60s, from the 70s, from the 80s, from now, stuff that was published last week, and mix it all up. After Contest of Champions, something came out called Secret Wars. Now, this was a 12-issue series. It had a weird, lame villain called the Beyonder. The reason that character even exists is to just chuck all of these superheroes onto a weird alien planet and have them battle it out. The next one I talk about, it's called Infinity Gauntlet. Next year, we're gonna see the Avengers Infinity Wars with Thanos. We're pretty sure he's gonna get these gems and cause some crazy havoc. In the comic book, he wants to meet up with death and basically end all life to show his love for death. Now, you said he's meeting up with death. Is death Hela, or is that another person? Death in the Marvel comic book uh, universe is a different character, okay. but I think the smart play is that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, death is gonna be Hela, Thanos is trying to meet up with Hela, Thanos and Hela are gonna come together, as my guess, for Infinity Wars. After that, we, go. we got Civil War. Now this in the comic book series was all about the characters being forced to take their masks off. A little bit of a callback yeah. to Watchmen. It's like, look, we're deregulating superheroes. You can't have a secret identity anymore. Some characters agree with it, some characters don't. We also had a lot of stuff going on with the Illuminati. We had Black Panther, we had Doctor Strange. You know, obviously with the Marvel comics, you can have all of the characters in it, all inner fighting. Right. And that's really the, the cool thing about this. Also, the artwork in this is really top notch. Yeah. And let's end it up with a, a redo, a redux of, it's called Secret Wars. It's another war, it's got all these characters in it. I mean, this has got everybody, all the villains, all the good guys, all the bad guys. It's pretty cool, it's got amazing Alex Ross covers, the artwork is yeah. great. All right, Schnepp, so here we are. We have two books for someone to know what we're talking about, to see the best of the best. 
What two books would you? I'm gonna go a little old school and a little new school. I'm gonna okay. go with the very first Secret Wars because okay. you could get the the new Secret Wars, but this Secret Wars believe. has those characters from the 80s in their world of the 80s. It's a really fun read, and it's a great thing because you could see where a lot of these ideas, especially for the Marvel Cinematic Universe and later comic books, came from. So I'd pick this one. Okay. Then I would definitely go with Infinity Gauntlet. Why? Because <laughs> I think are. it's gonna tie in quite a lot with not only Thor Ragnarok but also in the Infinity Wars movie. And if you're a sweaty, you've probably read this already, but if you haven't, even if you are a sweaty and you're like, ah, I skipped it, check it out. It's really well written, it's really well drawn, and it's a good primer to get into the cosmic world of Marvel. Yeah, the important thing is knowing that the movies are gonna take elements from here, but don't be that person who's like, they didn't do that. They're yeah. absolutely <laughs> not gonna do 90% of 90. this, but yeah. you will see some flavor from it. All yeah. right, Schnepp. We're now educated, let's get real. You wanna buy these? Yeah, let's do it. So once again, friends, we came, we saw, we got sweaty. Schnapp, thanks for coming out with me. Hey, man. Jeremy, I'm glad you're gonna check out the Infinity Gauntlet and Secret Wars, a lot of sweat. That's right, and if you guys wanna check out more about the wars or the gauntlet, support your local comic book shop. Thank you to Meltdown Comics for letting us film here, Schnapp. We got some book to read, my friend. What's up, sweaties? You're watching Comic Book Shopping. I'm John Schnepp. I'm standing at Earth 2 in Sherman Oaks with Michael Giacchino. What's up, Michael? No, you know, we're here. We're going to look around. We're going to have fun. Have you already seen Incredibles 2? It's mind-boggling. I don't even know how that all happened. So I called Feige and I was like, what are we doing here? He emails me that frame. He goes, this is what we're doing. From that moment on, my life really changed. We're going to talk about your comic book obsession, maybe, <laughs> your musical career yeah. as a composer, and get into comic. Let's do it. And hopefully we'll get some info out of you as well. Maybe. All right. You started scoring video games, like the entire Call of Duty series. How'd you get into scoring video games? You know, it was weird. I was working at Disney, working in their marketing department. The more I was there, I started learning about like, oh wait, this is how the films get made. And one day a job came up for an assistant producer to, for video games. And knowing that the uh, producers were hiring the composers, I thought if I can get a job as a producer, maybe I could hire myself to write music for whatever it is I'm working on. I got that job and that's pretty much what happened. I was able to then start hiring myself to do the music for those games. And the big break was working for Steven Spielberg on the Lost World video game for PlayStation. Right. You know, at that time, video game music was a lot of beep, boop, 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 right. this kind of stuff. So the PlayStation was the first time you were, it gave you the ability to put CD quality audio on the game. And one day, Steven came in for a meeting, and my music was in that game. They said, Steven would like to talk to you. And Steven's like, I love the music you did for the game, but we're going to record it with a, a live orchestra, right? Now, at that time, the, the CEO and the CFO and everyone else at Dream was like, we're not going to pay for a live orchestra. But when those words came out of Steven's mouth, suddenly everyone was like, yes, of course we're going to do it with a, a live orchestra. And uh, I have to say, from that moment on, my, my, my life really changed. Are comic books uh, an influence for you? And what influences you when you're composing? Well, I mean, look, I love comic books. I love Will Eisner. And that was one of the things that Brad Bird and I connected on when we met to talk about The Incredibles. That was my first movie. So Brad and I started talking. We talked about Johnny Quest. And then we got into Will Eisner. We got into Spirit. We got into all these other things. And before you knew, we were like, we love all the same things. And then I was ended up working on the film. So those were influences to me that I love. I love the, you know, if I look at a Will Eisner comic, literally, you could. You could shoot it as it is. They're like the greatest storyboards. Some of the best comics can actually visually make you feel like you're watching a movie Absolutely. in your own head. Uh, you know, a Sin City or a Watchmen. Some adaptations that really took the frames right out of the yep. comic as well as the words. And they would be foolish successful. not to. Yeah. Right? To, to try and reinvent what is already perfect, why, why would you even try? 
So speaking about movies, you scored The Incredibles, you did Doctor Strange, <laughs> yes. you did Spider-Man Homecoming. <laughs> Are there any other future superhero movies in your future? You know what, I hope so. I tend to, I really like the ones, the films that concentrate on a character. And it's fun to give them themes too. Like I love it when these guys have themes. I mean, we, we grew up with Superman, oh, yeah. right? And John Williams has created like the greatest themes known speaking, to man. Speaking about John Williams, yeah. you had a tough act to follow on Star Wars uh -huh. Rogue One. I think if I had had more time on that film, it would have been a lot harder for me and I would have thought a lot more about it. But when I was hired, I only had four and a half weeks to write the score. And I remember my brother saying to me, he's like, what are, why, are we, why would you even be concerned? You've been writing this in your head since you were 10 years old. You've been wanting to do this, you know? And he's right, because I was obsessed with Star Wars growing up. I had all the action figures. I still have all my original toys. Kenner was the most amazing company, because I remember when I bought a Princess Leia. The Princess Leia came, and there was no gun. So I wrote a letter, dear Kenner, this is, you know, so and so. About, I don't know, four weeks later, five weeks later, a package comes in the mail with a letter that said, we're so sorry. As an apology, please accept this package of guns. And it was literally every weapon from the Star Wars universe in this big, like tons of them. Wow. They, someone just grabbed a handful and shoved them in the thing. At the time, it was like getting the Ark of the Covenant. You know what I mean? Sure. It was just like, my head exploded. Speaking of guns and Rogue One, let's yeah. check out Jen Erso. She's right over they here. They have her here? Yeah. Jen, there you go. I mean, that was the first theme I wrote for, um, for Rogue One was her theme. I was a stormtrooper actually in Force Awakens. Did you get to shoot a blaster or what'd you do? I got to arrest uh, Poe Dameron. In the beginning of the film, when two stormtroopers bring Poe to Kylo, I was the guy on the right. And I throw him down and they have a little talk and then he says, frisk him and I frisk him, which is, by the way, impossible to frisk anybody in a stormtrooper outfit. Because first of all, you can't see anything. Right. So I'm just like, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. I guess he's okay. Let's talk about apes. Even before Star Wars, that was my first obsession as a kid, mm -hmm. Planet of the Apes. And I literally have, you know, sketchbooks where I just, page after page, where I would just draw the apes. And in that same sketchbook, you'll find tons of drawings of the Enterprise. You know, I mean, it's crazy to think, like, if you literally just look through that sketchbook of mine from when I was 10, it has everything in it that I'm working on now, which is, it's mind boggling. I don't even know how that all happened, but. It's called a dream come true. I guess so. That's pretty amazing. I guess so, yeah, it is, it is. Have you already seen Incredibles 2? Have you begun thinking about the score I for have, that? I have, I have, I've seen a version of it. It's gonna be really fun. You know, my first response when Brad said, yeah, we're gonna do Incredibles 2, I was like, no, 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 let's not do it. I said, we, the first one was good, it was really good, it worked, we did that. It's the perfect Fantastic Four movie. I said, yeah, what like... if we mess up? What if we? What if it's no good? What if we, you know, I was like with all this fear, like, no, no, no. He's like, come on, we gotta do it. If we don't do it, someone else is gonna make it. We can't have that happen. Right. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. I guess you're right. So I was a little uh, intimidated at first, but now I'm really excited actually to jump in. Well, let's get into some comic books. Let's yeah. pick some up. Sounds good. All right, Michael, so let's get into some graphic novels. I know you like graphic novels. I don't know if you've ever read Leica. I have not. I love this. It's, and it's about the dog that went up into space in Russia. I would recommend right, that. Well, don't put it away. I'm I'll getting that. take that. Let's get into some old school madness with oh, Ditko Unleashed. Oh, my God. Now, this comic, just flip through this, man. There's Spider-Man, there's Doc Strange. I wonder if they talk about that one panel from Spider-Man. I forget the issue it's from, but I remember I was, when I was working on Spider-Man, there was this one scene, you know, where uh, Peter Parker's trapped underneath this giant concrete thing, and he slowly started lifting this thing up. Issue 33 of Spider-Man, I believe. There we go. Yeah. So I was, I was watching, I'm like looking at this, and I'm like trying to figure out when is the part where we want to hear the theme. So I called Kevin Feige, and I was like, what are we doing here? He goes, hold on. He emails me a picture of that frame. He goes, here it is, right yeah. here. This is what we're doing. Look, there you go. Nice. Vulture. Doesn't look like yeah. Michael Keaton. Now, I know you have this, The New Frontier by Darwin Cook. Oh, yeah. But I love to suggest it anyway. I mean, just to flip through it and get all you sweaties to buy it, you should definitely be buying this comic book. You should literally buy anything he does. Yes. Anything he did, uh, it's just incredible. 
Tom Hardy has been talking about doing it, starring in the adaptation of 100 Bullets. This is an incredible series. Oh, these are great shots. I, I call it a shot, like I'm looking at it as if it's a shot from a film. Alrighty, perfect. What else is good? The return of Matt Wagner's mage character. I saw you eyeballing this Adam yeah. Strange omnibus. Come on, look at that. This, this has like me written all over it. This is like, you know, I don't even know what's inside, but I just look at that and go, that's mine. Z the Zeta Beam, the whisked into the futuristic planet, planet of Ron. Ron. Ran, 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 Ron. Ron. I ran, I ran all the way to the planet, ran. Oh, that's horrible, <laughs> horrible. Um, so, I'm gonna yeah. give you all my next score. <laughs> I know you had you had oh. to have some of those magazines, right? I know this is amazing. Look at this! Oh my god, I love this. Well, you know what? You can't leave this comic book shop without getting the Shakespeare vinyl bust <laughs> bank. Does it open a door somewhere? If I if I actually activate it, will a door open? Uh, you can activate it, and the the head lifts up. I love this head. Really opens. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we got the Shakespeare bust. Let's go to the checkout. Yeah, covered. <laughs> This is a lot of books. Oh my god. The checkout shall commence. All right, your grand total today is. What do we got? Seven dollars and twenty six. Very cheap to shop. I mean, this food. is real. I told you, this is a great place. It's like it's, like it's 1919 again. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. All right. You've been watching Comic Book Shopping. I'm John Schnepp with Michael Giacchino. Thank you so much, Michael. Oh, thank you so much. This is going to be amazing. I can't wait to get into all this. Oh, we got some amazing comic books from Earth 2 here at Sherman Oaks. I'll see you next time. Let's get out of here. Yeah, let's go see what doors this opens. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hello friends, once again we're at the world famous Meltdown Comics on Sunset Boulevard talking about comic book movies, comic books, where the worlds collide and merge. Schnepp, what do we got today? Well Jeremy, we are going to be talking about something that you and I have been talking about for a while. Yes. What are we going to talk about, Jeremy? We're going to talk about Swamp Thing. We're going to get into the origins of Swamp Thing and everything you want to read to know about Swamp Thing. Let's go to the swamp. Let's go, let's learn some swamps. Schnepp, here we are talking about something we've wanted to talk about for a while. Bring it, my man. That's right. Teach so us. we have both been uh, really big fans of the Swamp Thing. We want to share our love of the Swamp Thing with you. Now, Swamp Thing first appeared in House of Secrets issue number 92, and that led to his limited run of issues written by Len Wein and the late Bernie Wrightson. These comics are incredible. They're Swamp Thing versus all different kinds of macabre monsters. It went on for a while, then it got canceled. So Swamp Thing came and went, and then in the early 80s, he got rebooted. And mm -hmm. so his origin of Alec Holland, a scientist mm -hmm. who was covered in this uh, chemicals and ran into the swamp, and then kind of was reborn as a Swamp Thing, got flipped on its head by the writer Alan Moore. Right. So Alan Moore is coming here after writing Marvel Man and V for Vendetta. He was an unknown here in America, and Swamp Thing is where he made his mark by turning everything that we knew about the Swamp Thing on its head. In the issue number 21, it was called The Anatomy Lesson. Mm -hmm. where we find out that Alec Holland did die yes. in that swamp and that the swamp itself then thought it was a man. Right. And this entire time, this creature that is around has had these ideas that it's been a human trying to get back to its human form and its entire life has been a lie. And when it finds out that it is living a lie, it is one of the most horrific sequences 
I've ever read in a comic book ever. It was very Michael Crichton, because they back it up with science. Like, oh, if you do this with these worms, and then totally. it's, it's kind of the same thing, and you're like, oh my God, could this happen? You know, so at, at that point, yeah, he's not a human being anymore. What does it mean? Now, this was pre-Watchmen, uh, right? Oh, yeah. so, so this guy, he wasn't like Mr. Watchmen yet. It was like, right. well, I have an idea. They're like, yeah, sure. Here's that crappy property no one really cares about, yeah. and just made it one of the best horror comics I've read. If we could make this into a movie, I'm thinking John Carpenter, that vision is the ideal mm. type of director. I would like to see Duncan Jones take on this. Okay. Song. He's enough of a nerd and a sweaty that he would he actually gets this and he would be able to adapt the property, Alan Moore style. Pretty much just lift the comic mm -hmm. book script and make that the actual movie. Or if you did it as a TV series, I'd do one issue, mm -hmm. one show. All right, Schnepp, since I know one of the ones that I would recommend, let's do two. Okay. Two books to recommend to someone so they can get in on the Swamp Thing. What are we going to do? Well, I'm going to have to obviously recommend picking yeah. up the book one of Swamp Thing. You can get in trade paperback or hardcover Alan Moore's book one of Swamp Thing, and you will get addicted, and you will get book two and book three mm -hmm. and book four. You'll just get into it. Absolutely. Then I would definitely have to recommend getting these uh, Swamp Things by Len Wein and the late Bernie Wrightson. This is the original. Swamp Thing. They're gonna have it collected later on in a trade paperback and omnibus, but you could also find the original is issues for a very low price. Let's do it, Schnepp. Yeah. Let's get our swamp on. So there it is, we came, we saw, and we taught you, Schnepp. Thank you for helping me teach the folks. Thank you for teaching us all. Hey, we love Swamp Thing. We wanted to share our Swamp Thing love with you guys. People hear Swamp Thing are like, I'm not gonna read that. And then you read it and you're like, I can't wait to read more of it. Right, this is a bit of a passion moment for us. We wanted to do this for a really long time, so we're glad we brought it to you. And thank you to Meltdown Comics for letting us film here. Support your local comic book shops. If you want to read about Swamp Thing, Alan Moore or otherwise, I already have this one. A friend of mine could always use a new one. Haven't read this one, Schnepp. Gotta learn. Oh yeah. Let's do it. All right, folks, here we are at House of Secrets in Burbank, California with John Schnepp talking comic book movies, comic books, all the nerdy stuff we love. Schnepp, we got something today. Well, Jeremy, we've got a Batman movie. It's coming out. We don't know when, several years from now. Let's take a look at some of the comics and some of the inspiration that might be happening for that film. All right, let's do it. All right, Schnepp, so here we are. We're gonna talk about a DC character, a little known DC character, and maybe people don't know much about him. Who are we talking about? The Batman. Yeah, the smallest character ever, right? That's right. <laughs> you know, we've seen him covered in so many different ways. Most recently with Batman v Superman, mm -hmm. we've got the Ben Affleck Batman. We've got Matt Reeves coming on to do The Batman. So I picked two comics to talk about maybe what could be drawing some inspiration from okay. and what might have already been used. So let's go right. with uh, Batman No Man's Land. A lot of people have been talking about this comic for many years because this really was like kind of a, a cool turning point with the Batman storyline and integrated Batman storylines. Yeah, it's a, it's pretty much, if I remember it correctly, Escape from New York pretty much, where yeah. a big earthquake, a big devastation, they section off Gotham like, you know what, criminals, you have it. And so they kind of build their little territories. You see a lot of that in uh, Arkham City. You mm -hmm. see some of that in Dark Knight Rises. Kind of remind me a little bit of No Man's Land, the way it was all uh, sectioned off like that. No Man's Land pretty much got sourced for the Dark Knight Rises. Mm -hmm. They used a lot lot of this. I don't really feel like they might be using this mm -hmm. for the Batman movie, but right. it's definitely one you should check out and pick up. Here's a lesser known comic book. It's written by Jim Starlin and drawn by the amazing late Bernie Wrightson. It's Batman the Cult. It was uh, done a little few years after The Dark Knight, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight, okay. where they were doing these prestige formats where DC was experimenting with like square bound comic books and they were doing these four issue runs. This is one of those four issue runs. It was called The Cult. You could even see the influence of Frank Miller's Absolutely. storytelling within the panel oh, yeah. layout right from there. Bernie Wrightson. It's right there. So this is Dark Knight Returns. Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. He writes that, then boom, this comes out. This comes out heavily influenced. Obviously, Jim Starlin was heavily yeah. influenced by Frank Miller's Dark Knight. We see basically a, a much darker story with the Batman involved in this crazy, creepy religious cult. It gets pretty scary. And you know who's a great artist to draw horror Batman? Bernie Wrightson. So that's why I love this, Schnepp. That's why I love what we do 
new here because I've never heard of this and I feel like Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns came out and kind of overshadowed everything that may have subsequently come after it, maybe been inspired by it. I've never heard of this comic book in my life. All right, Schnepp, we have taught people about the Batman if they didn't know already. If you had to recommend a story, what would you do? I would definitely recommend The Cult. All it's right. a, one of the titles that definitely is under the radar and I want people to know about it. I love it, sounds interesting, sounds fantastic. Let's read it. So once again, Schnepp, we came, we learned, we conquered. I'd like to thank House of Secrets for bringing us along, letting us do this here. Support your local comic book shop if you too want to learn about Batman versus cults. Schnepp, let's go learn about Jim Jones. That's right, let's drink some of that Kool-Aid. <laughs>
Once again, we are here at House of Secrets with the John Schnepp talking about comic book movies, comic books, all the stuff we love that make us nerds. Schnepp, what do we got? Well, Jeremy, this week we're going to talk about Flash and the movie Flashpoint. So the comic book Flashpoint has a lot of different things in it. Let's see what might be in the film. Let's do it. Schnepp, here we are. The Flash has something for us. You have something for us. What do we got? The uh, Scarlet Speedster has been in a lot of epics. We're yes. going to go through a few of them until we get to that big, big one. So right. I have to mention Crisis on Infinite Earths. This is the classic. This is the re-universe shaping storyline told by Marv Wolfman and George Perez, where they basically took all of the different universes, all the different Supermans, and kind of melted them all into one universe, one cohesive universe. This is the issue where, you know, one of the Flashes died and stayed dead for a little while until he came back and he's the, he was the bridge between all the worlds. Henceforth, the bridge to all the different worlds in the bridge into Flashpoint. So the idea that the Flash can actually go through time and space mm -hmm. into other universes, the, the Crisis on Infinite Earths, he came and visited certain other characters and was like, I'm dying. You'd see him like falling apart and disintegrating. In Flashpoint, we get a totally different world. So mm -hmm. that's what's pretty exciting about what, you know, we've heard the Flash movie is gonna be called Flashpoint. Is the movie version gonna adapt the storyline from the comic books where Wonder Woman is like kind of almost an evil mm -hmm. tyrant? What are your thoughts? Like you just said, while Wonder Woman is a bit of a tyrant, she's at war with the Atlanteans, you know? In Flashpoint, Bruce Wayne is not Batman. Batman's actually Thomas Wayne in this other world. Bruce Wayne was killed. Thomas Wayne's a bit more gritty. He'll drop people off a roof if he really wants to. So that's the question is, are they going to straight up adapt this or are they gonna do what the show did? The TV show did Flashpoint. Mm -hmm. They didn't really go that route, which is basically a very contained thing for Barry Allen. He put things back, but when he did put things back, things were still slightly different. So in every rendition of Flashpoint, when it gets put back to normal, Certain things are still different, so I have to believe the movie's going to go that route also. I agree, too. I mean, I want to see this sequence with uh, the Amazons fighting right, Atlantis. Right, because they have all of them. That's the thing. Yeah. The TV show didn't have an Aquaman, didn't have a Wonder Woman. The movie does have those, so you have to think, like, this scenario right here, where Wonder Woman and Aquaman are fighting, is possible to see in Flashpoint, because they have that in the cinematic universe. So where would we go, Schnepp, to see this Flash Elseworld to, to know what we need to know going forward in Flashpoint, what would we need? You should be picking up Prices on Infinite Earths. You should have gotten that because I think I've recommended it a few times. I think you have. To learn about Flashpoint, you got to go to Flashpoint. This is the place to start. Really excited to see what the DC Cinematic Universe is going to do with this and how the rest of the DC Cinematic Universe is going to change after this. To the point, if you're going to learn about Flashpoint, you might as well get Flashpoint. So I've read it before. There's nothing wrong with reading it. Two, three, seven, nine times. So it's good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Let's do it. All right, Schnepp, so we came, we saw, we got updated, we learned about the story that the movie will probably loosely be based on, but you know, kind of follow, but thank you very much for that. Oh, you're welcome, Jerry. And thank you to House of Secrets for letting us film here. Support your local comic book shops if you want to learn more about Flashpoint. Schnepp, I've already read it, but let's read it again. Speed Force. <laughs> You're gonna shit wrap me up, Tom. <laughs> hey, you know, before you start. Yeah, why don't you relax for a second, Ellis? Why don't you just relax for I a minute? I gotta tell right? you, Pete, you know, I'm walking hey. around this place. I see a guy, a guy's dressed a potato with a cape. What's That's going right. on? I, with I it? don't even understand his cosplay, Tony. It's so weird. Everybody's all moist out here. It's like comic, it's a con. Is it a con? Is it a comic? What is it? That's right. There's a lot of comedy, there's a lot of moisture. I'm a, I'm a little sick of it. I need a cannoli. I you need know, one too. We're thrilled to be here at American <laughs> Comedy Company. I don't know that this stage has ever seen comedy. 
that what you guys just gave us. I appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate I mean, it. Snap. You're one of these guys that when I hear about comic book movie news and it gets announced and you're hearing about things that are shooting or going into production, I think about you and what your reaction is going to be because you tend to be pretty vocal and animated when you hear news. So I'm going to give you some news right now is that Shazam is scheduled to go into production in 2018 and the director is going to be the Lights Out Helmer, David F. Sandberg. How does that news hit your ears? Well, we've been hearing about David F. Sandberg for like months now. Mm -hmm. Like he was in the, you know, contention, like possibly he is going to be directing now that they finally made it official. Shazam is happening. I kind of, I like that, that news better than having Black Adam happen first because I always thought that was weird because that's Shazam's villain. Right. So I was like, why are the villain? This would be like having the Joker movie. You're like, what about Batman? Yeah, later, we'll announce it's that. It's like opening with Job of the Hutt. You yeah. know, you gotta... <laughs> we've got the Penguin standalone that we've got to get to before. Yes, and then the Riddler miniseries. So um, no, I'm happy that they're doing Shazam. I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know who's going to be playing Shazam. I hope it's Joe Manganiello. I really do. Yeah. Joe Manganiello is a guy that I think, is, I know he's supposed to do Deathstroke. Right. But now maybe you know things have changed with Matt Reeves' script that maybe now they can use him for something like Shazam. I think that would be really cool. I think another reason with like Black Adam, the reason that they, they at first that's when they were trying to throw everything together, and now they have kind of a more of a clear cut plan. And I think by trying to get uh, the Rock at the at, at the time that they did, they locked him down. Now they at least have them to that contract. They can do Shazam and then bring Black Adam in later. That's right. Now, I didn't get a chance to talk to you or you about this news, too, because usually when Christian and I talk, we're just figuring out which shirts Copster is going to wear that weekend. But <laughs> there's breaking news, I guess, too, is that Suicide Squad 2 is going to be filming next year as well with uh, Jean-Michel Serra from The Shallows directing it. How does that news hit your ears, Harlow? I mean, I think that we kind of saw that coming because there's been a lot of hype up for it. You know, there, was, there were the rumors, obviously, that Mel Gibson was going to direct it, and then John Colette Serra was, I think, last week, two weeks. As these stories kind of tend to come out, the more and more they come out and the more and more they're talked about, the more and more you hear about they're going into production. And we're obviously, this is the time to announce it. If you're going to announce Suicide Squad 2 going into production, the question is, how are they going to turn it around? What are they going to do with it? So uh, I think that it makes a lot of sense that it was announced. Shep, can we hope for more Enchantress in Suicide Squad 2? A lot of more dancing, more things coming out of the air in a centralized area with uh, garbage in the sky. Can't wait for more of that shit. But it is um, a neat story. I mean, no, I know. No, look, you know what? I'm, I'm really excited about Warner Brothers' big panel uh, on Saturday because mm -hmm. I want to hear about Man of Steel 2, I want to hear about Wonder Woman 2, and I want to hear about the Batman. I want those are the. You think they're going to do Man of Steel 2? Yes. Wow. I mean, it's kind of weird that they haven't done a Man of Steel 2, and yet they're announcing Suicide Squad 2. I know that made like 800 gajillion dollars. Yeah. So that makes sense, but you know, look, I want to, like we've talked about this a lot. I want to see Suic Suicide Squad fighting an even more evil version of this. It's got to yeah. be the bad guys fighting the badder guys. Is this crazy? I want a curveball. I want a curveball. I want to see them, if they're going to announce Man of Steel 2, and I, and I want to see a curveball, and they say Patty Jenkins does Man of Steel 2. That would be like, I know it won't happen. Ass. I know it won't happen, yeah, but it it'd be... It, it, you never know. She's going to do Wonder Woman 2. Look, Suicide Squad 2 could be Suicide Squad versus Justice League, so they just get both sequels done in one giant, uh, you know... <laughs> It could be. I mean, we're also hearing rumors that there's going to be some Aquaman footage is going to be shown in Hall H this Saturday. So that gets me excited. As a guy, like, you look at Aquaman, and he's kind of like that kid that got picked on in school and then got a gym membership. And it's like, <laughs> whoa, this is the guy we used to make fun of? He's kicking ass right now. They he's to got do a that. beard, too. Yeah. You know? Well, they switched up. Everybody thought of Vinny Chase when they thought of Aquaman. And now, <laughs> and now they think of Jason Momoa, and you're like, ah, fine, you talk to fish, that's cool. Right. I mean, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, put in a good word for that whale for Right. Me. Hey, you know, what are you going to do? I like sushi. I yeah. uh, can't let you guys get out of here, first of all, on the, that note, but also on a Star Wars. we got, we got to talk a little bit about this. Christian, yeah. what's the latest goings on in the world of Star Wars? Because they're not having an official presence no. film-wise down here at Comic-Con. They haven't had an official presence the last week. I mean, think if you look at D23, um, for maybe those you do or do not know, I think what was supposed to happen was they were going to show, before all the drama went down with Han Solo, they were going to show a Han Solo trailer. They definitely were going to show that thing. And then they would have the same behind the scenes footage they had for Last Jedi, and that would have been a great panel. The drama happens, and then Last Jedi gets it all on its shoulders. They show that, and it was a little, fans were a little let down by it, you know? But not, it's, the movie's still going to be awesome, I think. Last Jedi, I can't wait for it to come out, but that's really, there's no new news. Remember, Kathleen Kennedy said at one point, we're supposed to get an announcement for the next standalone movie by the end of June, early July, and nothing. Of course, you're not going to announce that right now because there's too many things up in the air. We're not getting anything at Comic Con. It's not going to happen. I think, that new, not including like book announcements and things of that nature, but. There, it's all on Last Jedi's shoulders right now. I think you'll get some. Uh, Ron Howard tweeted out a picture today. I think of um, uh, what's of um, Glover. 
Yeah, Dan, Daniel Glover. Uh, Danny Glover. Glover. Danny Glover. Yeah, Danny Glover. Yeah. Yeah, Danny Glover yeah. too. He's in it. Uh, Donald Glover. <laughs> that would be great, oh, though. What if Riggs and Murtaugh showed up in the middle of it? That would be amazing. amazing. Yeah. They belong in that universe. Too old for this. Um, <laughs> but I think that, that it, you know, there's little tidbits that Ron Howard. Ron Howard is doing it right, though, right now. He really is. He's got to play cleanup, but he's, it's, they brought him on to do the Ron Howard thing, and he's doing the Ron Howard thing. He's the way that he's tweeting, the way that, I mean, because when, when he announced it, if you guys watched Jedi Council, I wasn't thrilled with the fact that they brought him on. And I started thinking about why they brought him on, and it, made per, it makes perfect sense. It does, because he's doing exactly what you want Ron Howard to do. Yeah, they didn't want 21 Jump Street with Han Solo. And I feel like that's kind of what the Lord Miller We'll never really know, though. We, you're right. We yeah, I mean, it's, that's Was a report. Was Han Solo talking out of his butt like Ace Ventura? Right. We don't know. That right. report was the craziest one. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I made the joke on Jedi Council, and then two days later... Chewie! <laughs> <laughs> right. I can imagine. I mean, Ace does love animals. Chewie right. is a big dog, but right. it just doesn't seem like it makes sense for a Han Solo movie. And they treated that thing at D23 like it was the cousin that you do not want on Family Feud with you. You right. know? It's just, they, they're just like, hey, welcome to the Star Wars panel. Han Solo's movie coming out. Last Jedi! Woo! Right. And then they showed us behind the scenes, and that was it. Well, it was, I like I liked the behind the scenes. It was I, cool. They showed a bunch of weird little creepy creatures. I love the dog. Like, yeah. It's yeah. Like the, the, the video itself was really cool. Mm -hmm. It's just, like, again, the amount of pressure it had on it to be the only thing. That's why they didn't have Star Wars close out D23. And that's also the fact that they're not doing anything here. Um, I, I just think the next big thing we're going to get from Star Wars is the next Last Jedi trailer, which will probably hit sometime in September or October. And I don't think you, you get a Han Solo trailer until maybe end of the year, early next year. Yes, yeah, something that did uh, close out the D23 live action panel was the Infinity War trailer that you and I got to see, Christian. I didn't right. get to see it. Schnepp did not get a chance to see it. No. Um, round of applause if you guys want to see Marvel show that on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show it. Like, I'll show it. I hope they show it, and I hope that maybe everybody who slept in line overnight to get into Hall H gets a chance to see it first, and then they can drop it online the next day. But Christian, I mean, I'm still recovering from what I saw. I wish they ran it nine times. I hope that they do it. They only showed it once at D23, and you're like, oh, poor you. Um, but but <laughs> I'm telling you, I know if, if people are planning to camp out for Hall H, it's, and they do show it, I promise you it's worth it. That thing is incredible. It, mm -hmm. I mean, because you, you get hyped up with the idea of what it's going to be about. But Thanos in the trailer is everything that I've heard he's supposed to be. It, the trailer is pure chaos in the best way possible. Yeah, so Sweden, if you guys are camping out, that's more room in the hotel for the three of us. <laughs> I don't want to see it now. Kind of, <laughs> kind of bored with it. Liar. <laughs> Play it cool, Hotshot. Yeah. Well, now all the pressure goes out to somebody in the crowd because we have time for a couple questions for John Schnapp and Christian Harloff. So keep your hands up there, and Wendy Lee is going to find you sooner rather than later. I got to get you, my man. I got th that He was the first hand that went up. All right, so we got to go up. I was, I was trying to be lazy and not yeah. walk as far. I'm coming. <laughs> But I know who he is, but yeah. no one else does. So tell us your name. Jamal. And Jamal, where are you from? Chula Vista, California. What is your question for Schnapp and Christian? My question is, in your opinion, do you think that in the new Justice League trailer, they're going to show a shot of Harry McEvil returning in the black suit? Ooh. Well, you know, I mean, there's a lot of sites that were, like, running some trailer description for the Just League uh, 2. And, like, just like, you know, when Avengers Infinity War, I was like, eh, eh, like, reading every single <laughs> sign. Like, this has a tidbit about this. No, they left out this part. So whatever, you, like, kind of put together something in your mind. But none of us have seen it. Like, none, like 99.9999% of the entire planet, only these lucky guys and a bunch, like, 3,000 other people got to see that We're trailer. so cool, dude. Yeah. Not really. You'll, you can stop hating them on Saturday. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know what? The black suit's going to be in there. We know that. So. Is it going to be in the trailer, you think? I think so. Well, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I think it's not its not like a big surprise to anybody that Superman's going to eventually be in this movie. But the so, question, so I, I think the question is, should it be in the trailer, him in the black suit? That's kind of a cool it, reveal. It's a big reveal. For the movie, but you're yeah. also selling it to everybody. And right. so even if my mom saw, why is Superman wearing a black suit? It's, it's kind of a catch-22, because I don't necessarily think you need to show him. Because there's so many personalities and so many characters that even if he wasn't in the movie, you'd still want to see it. But obviously we know at some point, I think either halfway through the movie or a little bit after, he'll be in the movie. Yeah, but they already got these Walgreens commercials with like Batman, like Superman, I'm going to school with a backpack. Like, you're like, He's in the movie. We know it. Right. It's, like, it's like not a big surprise. <laughs> Backpacks are not just for kids anymore. Let's do one more question for Schnepp and Christian. What do we got here? She, she's aiming the other way, my man. I'm, 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 heading, back, I'm heading back to the person that I was with in the back of the room, because I haven't shown this part of the room any love yet. Hi, what's your name? Alex. 
And Alex, where are you from? New York. How are you? That is a pretty impressive David Griffin beard, too. (laughs) (laughs) It's more like a James Harden. Yeah, it's it's not $225 million good, but it's pretty good. (laughs) Um, Thanks for coming out here, guys. Uh, We hear that Sylvester Stallone is working on Creed II, the script, right now. Um, With his commitment to Black Panther, do you think Ryan Coogler will direct Creed II? I do. I I think that Stallone, um, if you don't know this or not, uh, Stallone got pitched Creed the first time around when he had not seen Fruitvale Station. He said, no, I don't, I'm, no thanks, I don't want to do it. And Coogler had pitched it. Then he saw Fruitvale Station. He's like, I'm gonna, I want to do this. And he did it, and how great did that work out? Because how, Coogler knows this character. He knows this world. And I think that the reason that they're taking this break, it was supposed to come out this year, uh, part two. And now that he, he's, I think they're waiting for him, let him take his break. I bet you him and Stallone have been talking, and I would not be surprised if Cougar returns. I kind of hope. I don't think they do it without him, unless you get um, uh, Gavin McConnor to do, you know, who did um, Warrior to do it, then maybe. But I, I think I'd want to see Cougar return. Yeah, Chanel, we got reports this week that Stallone is actually writing a follow up to Creed, but now it's the question of Stallone writing a treatment, and maybe he's the one that has to sell Cougar this time around. Do you think it's going to work as well? Only if the Guardians 3000 show up and they're like, Creed, we need you. And then it's a, it's a weird Marvel crossover. That's a, that's a different moment. That's different. different oh, the different moment. worlds. Yeah. That's right. All right. I'll see Creed too. I enjoyed Creed 1. All right. Well, let, let's call out the elephant in the room. And it is the son of a monster Russian boxer. Should Ivan Drago's child be the one that is fighting Adonis Creed in Rocky 2 or Creed 2? Wow, there we well, go. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think you start relying on stuff. It's too sticky. I wouldn't mind if Drago showed up. Because remember, Clubber Lang was supposed to show up in the last right. one, but Mr. T wanted too much money. Really? Uh, but, but the fact that, you know, having Drago in it, like Dolph Lundgren in it, would be cool. I don't think he needs to fight Drago's son, though. I think uh, it's Clubber Lang's son. With yeah, a there's nothing, and there's nothing going on in Russia yeah. these days. Oh, wait, never mind. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And with that, I want to thank Christian Harlov and John Schnapp for joining us here today. Give them a Thanks, hand. guys. No, you go down. <laughs> yeah. Christian hasn't been on stage in a minute, but uh, he still packs a punch. That, like, like really, the, the Creed 2, whether it's going to be Dragon.